Good afternoon. Um, I am uh, Bonnie Glazer. I'm a senior fellow in the Freeman Chair for China Studies at, uh, at CSIS. And uh, I, I apologize for, uh, for being late this morning. I think that we can say that Taiwan's uh, elections are a bit more predictable than the metro system these days. <laughs> We are very pleased to have with us as a, as a luncheon speaker uh, today, Dr. Richard Bush, uh, who I'm sure many of you know. Uh, Dr. Bush is a senior fellow and director at the Brookings Institution's uh, Center for Northeast Asian Policy Studies. Uh, prior to that, uh, he was head of AIT. Uh, he was the um, national intelligence officer for East Asia. Uh, and uh, before that worked in the House Foreign Affairs Committee's uh, subcommittee on Asia uh, Pacific Affairs. Um, he has a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, about Taiwan, so we're very, very pleased that he agreed uh, to speak to us today. And uh, we will have some uh, uh, Q&A uh, after his speech and then probably take a very short, maybe uh, five or ten minute break before we move on uh, to our last panel. Richard? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to speak to you today to offer a few personal remarks on Saturday's election and what it means for Taiwan's democracy, cross-strait relations, and U.S.-Taiwan relations. Um, in, in doing so, I uh, will only supplement uh, what we've heard from the really outstanding presentations uh, that we've heard so far and uh, the uh, outstanding presentations that I'm sure we're going to hear after I speak. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of two people who came in uh, um, after our initial start, or after I spoke before. One is Jacob Zhang, uh, Deputy Director at Tecro, and the other is uh, my good friend Ray Burkhart, who's the Chairman of the American Institute in Taiwan. We're really glad to have you. Um, I guess I'd start out by conveying congratulations uh, to President Ma for winning re-election, uh, for Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, um, who um, did almost the impossible by rebuilding the DPP and making this a competitive election. Uh, I think the real winners are the people of Taiwan. Um, Bonnie mentioned my congressional experience, uh, my boss for most of that time was uh, Steve Solars, uh, who passed away uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, I think Steve would have been really pleased to um, see uh, last Saturday's election. Uh, speaking about uh, the election and Taiwan's democracy, I think it was impressive in several respects. Uh, first of all was the turnout, 74%. Uh, uh, it's true that that's uh, sort of less than previous elections, and uh, we've heard uh, why that is uh, something to be expected. Um, but it's still impressive, and it demonstrates that Taiwan citizens take their civic responsibilities very seriously, more so, it seems, than Americans. Uh, second, this election cycle was peaceful. There was one small incident, really more a plan uh, than an incident that uh, uh, a person had and the authorities w were able to spot it uh, before the event and, and stop it, and that's good. And as far as we know, there were no other attempts to influence the outcome in a truly inappropriate way. That's a welcome contrast to some past elections which were marred by regret regrettable episodes of violence. Uh, the third impressive aspect of this election was that it was competitive. Uh, if one looked at the DPP in the spring of 2008, after its defeats in the legislative and presidential elections that year, uh, you might not have pre predicted that it would be able to give the Kuomintang a run for its money uh, this year. Um, and the fact that this was a pretty close election is a great testament to Dr. Tsai Ing-wen's leadership in rebuilding the party organizationally, financially, and in terms of personnel. Um, indeed, over the past uh, decade, both of Taiwan's political parties have demonstrated a remarkable resilience uh, after having faced setbacks. 
I think that that resilience is really good for the public because a democratic system without competitive parties doesn't work very well. Um, in this election, the Taiwan people deserved a choice, and Dr. Tsai made sure that they got that choice. Um, fourth is the quality of uh, the two major presidential candidates, uh, President Ma ying and Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, both are friends of mine, so uh, I think I'm going to rely on the assessment um, of Time magazine, uh, on which I really can't improve. Uh, and I quote, neither Ma nor Tsai can resolve the island's existential problem. Still, they do Taiwan proud. Both are informed, confident, articulate, well-educated, well-traveled, passionate about making a difference, and genuinely concerned about the future of their land. Traits that any electorate, I underline any, uh, would want in its leaders. Uh, too bad one of them has to lose. But whatever happens, as the freest place in the Chinese world, Taiwan wins. Um, a fifth feature of the presidential campaign was that the debate on the issues was pretty good. Um, I don't want to exaggerate this point too much. I have a, a, a friend in Taiwan who, who remarked to me a few weeks ago, um, U.S. elections have agenda setting. Taiwan elections have scandal setting. Um, now, it, it's certainly true that alleged scandals are a common feature of Taiwan politics, uh, but uh, really, uh, the American process isn't, that it's always, isn't always a high-minded and substantive discussion of important policy issues. Uh, I guess I'm a little bit jaded having to sit through what passes for political discourse in this country. Um, in Taiwan, in this election, um, you know, President Ma ran on his record. Uh, he presented the voters in 2008 with a, uh, an agenda of what he was going to do, and he tried to do it, and he didn't succeed in every, uh, every case, partly because of circumstances beyond his control. But he didn't shy away from submitting his performance uh, to the judgment of the island's voters. And that's an, exam an admiral exa example in an incumbent official running for re-election. Uh, Dr. Tsai emphasized the negative consequences of President Ma's policies. And I think she successfully tapped the anxieties of those on Taiwan who haven't gained so much from President Ma's first term and who are uncertain about the future. And that's a perfectly legitimate way to conduct an elect electoral campaign. Um, of course, President Ma and Dr. Tsai emphasized issues that each thought were advantageous uh, for it and ignores, ignored those that were not, but that's politics. So the two candidates address serious issues, and objectively, it seems that Taiwan voters had available good information about the points of key policy difference and where various candidates and parties stood on those points of difference. We will learn a lot more from exit polls about why exactly voters marked their ballots the way they did, but I'm inclined to believe that they knew what they were doing when they cast their ballots. Now, Taiwan's practice of democracy is not perfect, and uh, Dr. Zhu Yunhan has uh, documented that uh, a few years ago, uh, at least some Taiwan people were beginning to lose confidence um, that their democracy was a good system. I, I do hope they're regaining that confidence. At the same time, I know that the Taiwan people would benefit from and deserve significant reform of some features of their system. Uh, obviously, the U.S. needs to reform features, features of its system. Um, any electoral system can distort the public will, including Taiwan's. Still, I think that this election indicates that the Taiwan system can do a pretty good job of first presenting the public with a clear policy choice and then accurately registering the dominant preference. So I hope uh, that the Taiwan public is regaining confidence in its system. Uh, Taiwan's performance as a democracy should give PRC leaders a certain confidence of their own that it is a system that can work well in any ethnically Chinese society. Um, moving to uh, cross-strait relations, um, the question on the minds of many, and we've discussed it this morning, is, is what the election means for relations between Beijing and Taipei. 
Will President Ma accelerate the process of reconciliation with China, moving towards negotiations on political and security issues? Of course, many in China would welcome such a trend. Some on Taiwan would fear it. My own analysis is that such a trend is unlikely. Um, the reason I say that is that the two sides uh, made progress in cross-strait relations uh, in the past four years because they began with a conscious decision to focus on so-called easy issues, mainly economic issues. Uh, those matters have now been pretty much exhausted. Uh, and any new issues that Taipei and Beijing take up will probably be hard. Uh, that is even true of some outstanding economic issues, such as liberalization of trade and goods and services, as uh, ECFA calls for. Um, investment protection and dispute settlement. Uh, the reason that economic negotiations get hard, I think, is that it increasingly they touch on vested domestic interests in both China and Taiwan. Um, my hypothesis that future issues will be difficult is even more true of political and security matters. On these, I believe the two sides have not yet laid a, an adequate conceptual foundation. Uh, for example, Beijing has signaled that negotiations on these matters uh, should be on the basis of the One China Principle. Taiwan would prefer the 1992 consensus, and, and that's a gap. Uh, in addition, uh, there is not yet a political foundation in Taiwan for such discussions. And uh, you only had to watch the response to uh, President Ma's idea of the possibility of a peace accord under certain uh, conditions uh, to see that um, that political foundation doesn't exist. Uh, it, what I would fear if the two sides somehow rushed into negotiations on political and security negotiations would be that they would soon hit an impasse. Um, the smartest thing, I think, for Beijing and Taipei to do in the second term is to consolidate the gains of the first one. Um, uh, there is a lot to be done in the manner of implementation to enhance mutual confidence that this, this new architecture uh, for cross-strait relations is going to work. Uh, in addition, I think that there is a potential for concrete steps like military, cross, uh, military confidence building measures and uh, assuming that they are crafted in a way that fosters true mutual security. Um, I do hope that, therefore, that Beijing remains patient and understands that the obstacles that must be removed for movement in any new areas can occur. Um, another area for movement uh, is, the, is the area of Taiwan's international space. Uh, we've seen progress in some, but not all, dimensions of this issue. Uh, the so-called truce on diplomatic partners, participation in the annual meeting of the WHA, and Taiwan's ability to conclude uh, trade liberalization agreements with uh, at least a few countries. But Taiwan needs a lot more. It really needs a lot more when it comes to trade liberalization. And now that Beijing doesn't have to worry about a DPP president for a while, um, I hope, along with Doug Paul, that it will respond positively to Taipei's desires and needs. On cross-strait relations, it's um, interesting, I think, to speculate on what might have happened if Dr. Tsai had won. Um, in the run-up to the election, the PRC, uh, as we know, said repeatedly that it would not deal with any Taiwan leader who did not accept the 1992 consensus. Um, Dr. Tsai, um, campaigned on the implicit idea, at least, that Beijing was bluffing uh, and that if she were elected, China would have such a stake in the current status quo that it would have to accommodate her. Uh, if she was correct, then she and her party could have secured the real gains uh, of the Ma administration but avoided what she regard regarded as the unacceptable costs. Uh, of his policies and an unwanted uh, political concession. Now, we'll never know whether China's position was indeed a bluff. And here I'm conflicted. 
Uh, there's my head and there's my heart. My head or my analysis tells me that the bluff was serious and, and that Taiwan would have paid some price uh, for its Tsai administration's refusal to accept the 1992 consensus. My heart or my hope would have been that Beijing would indeed come around in the end and worked out some sort of flexible arrangement. Now, I tend to trust my head over my heart. Um, um, uh, I, I also agree with Doug that um, it wouldn't have been a perilous situation. Uh, it would have been more a stall. Um, um, but to the extent that this was the key question for Taiwan voters, uh, they apparently were unwilling to take the risk uh, that Beijing was bluffing. Um, and it'll be interesting to see um, now that the votes are counted uh, how the DPP evaluates the reason for its defeat uh, and whether and how it adjusts uh, its China policy to take account of the result. Uh, let me turn to Saturday's election and U.S.-Taiwan relations. Uh, the White House, as you know, quickly released a statement uh, congratulating President Ma and expressing the hope that, quote, the impressive efforts that both sides have undertaken in recent years to build cross-strait ties will continue. In part, the statement said, because, quote, such ties and stability in cross-strait relations have also benefited U.S.-Taiwan relations. Now, there is some talk that the United States took deliberate steps to help President Ma win re-election. Um, I would state it uh, differently, actually, uh, and observe that even before President Obama was elected, uh, he had created an implicit linkage between President Ma's cross-strait policies and the future of U.S.-Taiwan relations. And Washington has expressed approval of uh, the results of President Ma's policies. Uh, in that situation, it would have been very surprising if the administration had not taken steps to improve U.S.-Taiwan relations accordingly. Um, the other thing I'd say is that we will probably never know how much emphasis Taiwan voters placed on the American factor, uh, as they cast their ballots, I'm, implied, I, I'm inclined to agree with Doug that it didn't have much impact at all. For the future, um, I would expect U.S.-Taiwan relations to continue to improve. Um, the two governments need to complete work on some important initiatives, such as the visa waiver program. Uh, there are no doubt other areas for progress. Uh, the area that is most compelling, I think, is the economic relationship um, because it is, it is not in Taiwan's interest to be excluded from the economic liberalization that is going on in the Asia-Pacific, uh, even as it carries through with ECFA with the PRC. The United States should be a major target of Taiwan's broader liberalization effort. Uh, this should be a strategic priority for both our countries. And in pursuing this priority, neither Taipei nor Washington should allow narrow domestic political interests to get in the way. Um, now, there has been some talk about the idea of the United States, quote unquote, abandoning Taiwan. Um, some of the people who put forward this idea are pretty famous. One even is affiliated with Bonnie's organization. Um, another shares her last name. <laughs> But she is in no way, she in no way shares their views or is responsible for those views, uh, nor do I. Um, the logic behind the idea seems to be that the United States faces a significant challenge from the rise or revival of China as a great power, which it does. Um, both the United States and the PRC talk about common interests and cooperation, but there is competition as well, and the future of the international system will defend, depend on the balance between competition and cooperation. Ensuring a good outcome uh, will not be easy, even if Taiwan didn't exist. And in this fraught situation, some people argue, uh, the United States, like the parent of rebellious teenagers, needs to pick its fights when it deals with China. We can't fight China on everything. So these folks um, deem Taiwan to be a strategic liability for the United States a fight that either cannot be won or is not worth fighting. 
uh, our relations with China and the future of the world will be much better off if we leave Taiwan to the tender mercies of Beijing, or so it's argued. But not by Bonnie and me. Um, it's worth noting that not all the scholars who have speculated on U.S. policy towards Taiwan focus on the U.S. abandoning Taiwan. Some uh, talk, in effect, about Taiwan abandoning the United States, which is interesting. Um, the idea here is that Taiwan, for its own interests, uh, would shift a po to a policy of fundamentally accommodating China. Now, some scholars think that this choice would be rational for Taiwan and good for the United States. Others worry that the choice would be ill-considered and bad for America. Now, my own view is that Taiwan does have a strategic importance for the United States, but as a strategic asset, not a liability. Now, please don't infer that I mean that Taiwan could be part of some U.S.-led effort to contain China. Um, that's not possible, and it would also be inconsistent with Washington's and Taipei's grand strategy uh, towards China, which involves uh, a significant degree of engagement. Rather, Taiwan is strategically important as a litmus test of what kind of great power uh, China will become. Now, in my view, if China approaches the Taiwan Strait issue um, in the future in a way that is flexible, conceptually creative, and responsive to the sensitivities of people on Taiwan, that would indicate uh, that China's revival will be positive. It doesn't guarantee it, but it's a good sign. If, on the other hand, China's approach to Taiwan is conceptually rigid, unresponsive to popular feeling, and laden with pressure tactics, uh, that will send a different message about the broader trend. Uh, because the United States has an interest in China's revival being peaceful and constructive, we have a big stake in how cross-strait relations develop. As Kirk Campbell testified in October, a peaceful future for cross-strait relations is central to the stability and prosperity of the entire region and is therefore of vital importance to the United States. Uh, moreover, uh, what the United States does concerning Taiwan will send important signals to America's friends and allies, both in Asia and around the world, to quote Dr. Campbell again, quote, our management of U.S.-Taiwan relations will have a great impact on the way our partners view us across the Asia-Pacific region. Um, by way of concluding, let me observe first that Taiwan faces a daunting policy agenda. Um, Taiwan uh, needs a strategy um, <laughs> to ensure that it remains economically competitive in a world of globalization and technological change. And economic liberalization is only one part of that strategy. Uh, other elements of that strategy probably include improving the education system and the policy infrastructure. Uh, a second part of this challenge is uh, um, that Taiwan needs to improve its defense strategy and the ability to carry it out because it can never be absolutely certain uh, that Beijing will never use its increasingly robust military power uh, for some degree of coercion. Third, uh, because Taiwan's sovereignty, uh, because the Republic of China is at the core of future political and security relations with China, Taiwan, I think, needs to think in more depth about the content of sovereignty, what that really means, what is important, what is trivial. Uh, fourth, as I hinted before, um, the political system needs reform to make it a better vehicle for reflecting the public will and making good policy choices. And I think this election uh, was relevant uh, for that agenda. Why do I think this? Uh, it happens that uh, I was relaxing Friday evening, uh, looking forward to a busy day on Saturday, and uh, I just made a mental note of the obvious that uh, people on Taiwan uh, had already begun to go to the polls and, and vote in this election since Taiwan's 13 hours ahead. 
I then marveled to myself, not for the first time, that it's really quite remarkable when a society and a political leadership vests in the choices of ordinary people the selection of that society's leaders. Um, ordinary people, uh, they vary greatly in their education and in their wealth and in their whole stake of, uh, in the society. They don't spend every waking hour worrying about policy issues, and yet they're the ones who choose. Now, those of us who are citizens of democratic systems uh, pretty much take this for granted, but it's actually not that common in human history, and it's not that common in the world today. And so whatever one thinks of Saturday's results, the people of Taiwan again confirmed this marvel of electoral democracy. Um, th they did convey, I think, in this result, uh, a certain anxiety and uncertainty about the future for understandable reasons. Um, so even as a majority of Taiwan voters endorsed uh, President Ma's continued leadership, um, the electorate uh, as a whole also issued a challenge to those elected leaders. That is, Taiwan citizens want their leaders to effectively meet the significant challenges that face the island today. And we can only hope that the island's leaders merit the public's confidence. Thank you very much. Richard has agreed to take some questions, so please uh, raise your hand and wait until the microphone comes to you and identify yourself, and please uh, make sure your questions are uh, concise. Um, Admiral McFadden. Eric McFadden, the Institute for Foreign Policy Analysis. Um, I reflect on two things that you commented on that um, the future policy and security issues will be the difficult ones. And I'm reminded of President Ma's um, uh, security policy of aligning diplomacy and defense. What I'm getting at here is, is there an opportunity for the U.S. and for Washington and Taipei to make an effort to con further convince those in Beijing who believe that, regardless of the circumstances, that something like an attack on Taiwan, regardless of provocation and so forth, is simply not something that serves China's interest. So I'm saying, is there this slant that we can take on it that will reinforce that sort of conviction and be a worthwhile effort in the political and security issue area? Um, I, Eric, uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, I think that that's really at the heart of President Ma's grand strategy. Um, on the one hand, he wants to reassure um, uh, Beijing that, uh, at least under his watch, uh, Taiwan will not challenge China's fundamental interests. And uh, so he is removing uh, any reason they would have to use coercion. Uh, in the first place. Uh, I think he is also um, working to expand uh, the number of reasons uh, why China has a stake in the status quo and uh, therefore would run risks um, of challenging it. Um, I think that this is mainly a job for um, Taiwan and its leadership. Um, I suspect that um, China would believe that if the U.S. Um, pushed too hard in, uh, uh, on this line, uh, that they would just assume that we had a, uh, a, a not-so-hidden agenda. Um, but uh, uh, obviously, this is a, a long-term process, and uh, I'm sure it will continue in the second term. Uh, and I hope the Chinese get the message. So Chris over there. Chris Nelson. Thanks very much, Bonnie. Richard, a really eloquent speech. Reminds us all why you're major adult supervisor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly for me. Um, it's been interesting that you're the latest speaker today to talk 
repeatedly in terms of what we hope the, uh, the Chinese will see and how we hope the Chinese will react. Um, uh, I'm asking you, uh, with your dual hat, uh, uh, you will also spend a lot of time looking at what's happening uh, in the mainland. We're going to have a visit fairly soon of the presumptive next president, Xi Jinping. What is your sense of how the Chinese will react uh, to uh, these various challenges that have been explained? Uh, and w uh, especially, what do you see as arising possibly this year that the Obama administration is going to have to work very hard to manage in a successful way? Thank you. Um, thanks for your question. Um, I expect that um, uh, there were sighs of relief in China Saturday evening uh, as they got the result. Um, perhaps there were hopes that uh, ordinary people in China did not uh, aspire to the same kinds of political freedoms that their Taiwan cousins have. Um, I guess uh, I think believe that uh, Beijing will be so focused on the um, coming transition in China and um, the domestic issues that will be at the heart of that, that um, um, we may not hear too much about Taiwan policy. I mean, if Dr. Tsai had won, it would have been a more complicated uh, situation. Um, uh, um, I, um, you know, it may be that some will say, oh, we have a narrow window uh, before Hu Jintao leaves office, but I don't hear so much about that. Um, uh, I think it's a fact of the Chinese system that it takes a little while for a new leader, uh, if he has uh, new ideas on a uh, sensitive issue like Taiwan is for Beijing, uh, to feed those into the policy system and uh, get them adopted. Um, and so uh, if um, Vice President, President Xi has, has some new thinking, uh, uh, it'll be a while. Um, I do think that this result um, confirms the wisdom of Hu Jintao's approach, uh, what he calls peaceful development. And uh, one important element of that is that um, the future of cross-strait relations, even under the best of circumstances, will be a long-term process. Uh, that China uh, can't get impatient, uh, and that there is a value in putting uh, uh, China's trust in the Taiwan people. Uh, I think that th that set of ideas and the people who have been responsible uh, for implementing them uh, have been vindicated. Thanks. I would also mention that we have, of course, on our uh, next panel, a leading scholar yes, from yes. Uh, mainland China who I'm sure will address that issue as well. Ambassador Burkhardt. It's coming. Right behind you. Right behind you. Uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Richard, um, I'd like to ask you to expand on two interesting points you made. Mm -hmm. One was you said that <laughs> in terms of uh, talking about a peace agreement or political issues, that Beijing's position is that it should be on the basis of the one China principle, whereas Taipei has said it can, should be on the basis of, as the previous discussions have been, on the basis of the uh, 92 consensus. <laughs> and I think we're aware of uh, efforts by Beijing to make to sort of shift towards something beyond the one China principle in private talks two years ago, 18 months ago. I don't recall hearing much about it lately. And I certainly don't recall hearing them ever sort of bring that out into the public. So I'd be very interested to know what, what you were referring to. You may expand more on that. And a second question, uh, another point you made I thought was very interesting. You said, uh, Taiwan needs to think more about the content of sovereignty. Um, that's a very interesting point, maybe related to the first one. Um, and uh, as one of the, uh, as the foremost uh, writer and analyst of the whole issue of Taiwan sovereignty, I'd be interested to hear your expansion on that subject also. Um, thank you. Uh, great questions. Um, my my um, 
observation about the basis of political and security talks um, is based on um, my reading of Hu Jintao's um, December 31st, 2008 speech, uh, where when he was talking about economic <coughs> relations, he said on the basis of the 1992 consensus. And, uh, but when he was talking about political and security issues, he said on the basis of the one China principle. Um, I think that that was not an unconsidered distinction. Now, to be sure, the 1992 consensus is in some way an interpretation or a gloss on the one China principle. Uh, and as you point out, there were conversations of a non-public sort which, su which suggested that the 1992 consensus was uh, not the only uh, way of interpreting or glossing the one China principle. Um, but I, I guess we should recall that, that the lodestar for China is one China. Uh, and so any gloss or interpretation uh, has to focus on, on that. And I think for political and security issues, the, um, it's much more, it will be much more important for China to identify the parties to whatever it is they're discussing, whether it's a peace accord or some sort of political framework agreement. Um, I think you can get away without being specific on the parties uh, to the deal. Um, in economic issues, uh, I think that's harder in political issues. Now, um, it may be that at some point in the future, the two sides find a way to um, do that in a mutually acceptable basis. I don't, and there have been some discussions uh, among scholars um, on this. Um, I think uh, a lot of those discussions come down to the point that for Taiwan, the Republic of China um, is very important. And what was it on election night? President Ma said, I will safeguard the Republic of China with my life. Uh, that's pretty strong statement. Um, so uh, I don't rule out them finding a way to do it, but uh, I think at this point the conceptual foundation uh, is still um, quite nascent. Now, on the sovereignty issue, and I, I don't want to put people to sleep uh, after you've had a nice lunch, <laughs> and uh, I'm always in danger of doing it when I talk about this issue. Um, l let me just observe that I think when Taiwan talks about um, international space, when Taiwan talks about sovereignty, uh, a lot of emphasis is on Taiwan's role in the international community. And that's proper because one dimension of sovereignty is uh, membership in the international system. And um, I, that is why it is important for Taiwan to expand its international space. Uh, the other reason is that Taiwan can make a contribution in many regards. Um, but Sovereignty can mean other things. Um, it can refer importantly to um, whether uh, a government has the absolute right to rule within the territory under its jurisdiction. That's the sort of core I Westphalian idea of sovereignty. Um, and no, countries will derogate some of that absolute right uh, when it's in their interest to do so, but um, um, not being interfered in in the way you uh, run your affairs uh, is very important. And, um, you know, we can look at the implementation of the one country, two systems formula in uh, Hong Kong and identify certain ways in which uh, <coughs> Beijing is... Um, sort of shaping outcomes from outside. Um, and it's um, so um, Taiwan would be um, 
sort of well advised to uh, think about that dimension of sovereignty as well. Um, I think that this is one of those areas where um, indeed a broader consensus on Taiwan would be a good thing. And perhaps uh, um, people from various sides, whether scholars or officials or semi-officials, could have some useful conversations that would strengthen Taiwan's position in dealings with the PRC. Norman? Norman. Uh, Norman Fu. I'm a columnist of the China Times. Uh, Richard, you seem to rule out almost completely uh, political discussions uh, during the second term of the Ma administration. Of course, Mr. Ma, during a press conference before the election, when he was asked about whether he would visit China, he said no, he had no plans. However, I want to mention something here which was not very widely uh, reported in Taiwan. <coughs> After his victory, he paid a visit to the gravesite of his father. Mm -hmm. You know, on his father's tombstone, there is an inscription. <laughs> it's almost like the political will to his uh, you know, son and other children. And the inscription says, prevent independence and promote gradual reunification. Well, Mr. Ma, as we know, is a very filial son. <laughs> I don't know what he said privately to his father. But that makes me sometimes wonder, especially if China extends Norman, an invitation. Norman. Is to there, him, is there to a question visit China. There? Is there a question there, Norman? Yeah, this is my question. If China extends the invitation to Mr. Ma to go and visit, especially in his capacity as the chairman of the Kuomintang, how would he handle um, I, I have no idea. Uh, I agree with you that <laughs> that that President Ma is a very filial son, um, but in addition, um, because his father's passed away, President Ma has a certain flexibility <laughs> in how he can interpret <laughs> his father's last wishes. Um, to, but to come to your specific point, um, I would hope that if Beijing leaders had the idea of inviting President Ma uh, to visit, that they would convey this interest very privately first, uh, to make sure that this is an invitation that President Ma wants to consider. And then whatever he does with it, uh, he can. Uh, but um, uh, to... Um, issue it publicly could be, is likely to be counterproductive. Also, the status under which President Ma visited um, would be, uh, I, I think, uh, an important question. Um, as, he, as it's clear, uh, the Republic of China is very important to him. And what are the implications for the Republic of China uh, and its legitimacy if President Ma goes as the head of a political party. In the back. Uh, Zhu Wang from U.S. Internal Trade Commission. Oh, Richard, you see, I, I heard you say that the uh, American have an interest to keep uh, Taiwan as a strategic partner. And this partnership is not, uh, not for cutting China. I think a lot of uh, people in China, include some American, Chinese Americans here, they thought this kind of uh, intention, they thought they, they tried to use uh, of Taiwan to cut in China. I think it's important to make clear that the Chinese leadership understand 
what is uh, American's uh, interest to make Taiwan as a strategic partner? So can you elaborate what you expect the role of Taiwan can play to guarantee or to try to keep China's race become a peaceful process? Thank you. Um, I didn't say that, that the United States regarded Taiwan as a strategic uh, partner. Um, some have said that. Um, but uh, uh, my main point is that um, Taiwan is, in, I would say, strategically important because it sheds light on what kind of great power China is going to be. Uh, and um, w we certainly have no intention of using Taiwan as a, a bargaining chip or uh, as a, a way of blocking China's rise, um, but it is an interesting test of China's intentions. Um, you know, I think that uh, our message uh, to China should be that we are not the obstacle for you to achieve your political goals. Um, the, the Taiwan people's view of your goals and your intentions and how you will implement them, that, that is the obstacle. And uh, you need to improve your offer. We'll take one last question, if there is one. David, or, go ahead. Want to take both of them? Yeah, sure. Okay. Both of them. All right. We will take the last two questions two. together <laughs> since they, your hands were raised simultaneously. Let's let her go first, followed by David Wong. Thank you, Kylie. I'm Jin Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Um, I'd like to link the last two questions and your statement that this will be a litmus test to show how China could be as a rising power. Mm -hmm. So I'm from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Would you please put in the context of the South China Sea, the position of Taiwan in the uh, U-shaped map and the sovereignty questions, and especially the statement <coughs> that President Ma said he would protect the PRC with his life, and the, the statement- ROC, ROC. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, ROC, okay. <laughs> ROC, okay, my mistake, I'm sorry. And then your statement that actually the U.S. and Taiwan are not strategic partners, but the U.S. and Vietnam, I believe we are strategic partners. Thank you. David? David, uh, David Huang from Academia Seneca, Taiwan. Uh, which of your presentation uh, touched my heart in the, in the sense that you accurately reflect the, uh, some of DBP's uh, thinking about uh, if Tsai Ing-wen got elected, that uh, Beijing would have no choice to accommodate them. I think based on this, uh, this kind of a thinking, behind this, thing, this kind of thinking, the assumption is that what would be the benefit for Beijing to appear to be inflexible if Tsai elections? Now, during the uh, uh, transition period, uh, you, uh, Beijing will face the transition period. They would like to have some stable one. They don't want to have a reverse uh, of the relationship, cut off any exchange, cross-trade exchange. So can you elaborate a little bit more about what would be the benefit if Taiwan got elections and Beijing would still appear to be inflexible and reverse the, the current trend of the cross-trade interactions? Well, let me take David's first. Um, I mean, all of this is speculative, obviously, and, and quite hypothetical, and I, and I learned as a diplomat not to deal in hypotheticals, but I'll, 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 um, I mean, I think the, sure, Beijing would have faced a dilemma, uh, but it, it's a dilemma of balancing uh, costs and benefits, and, um, the, the cost of somehow accommodating to its high presidency would be uh, to lose sort of credibility for its principles. Um, and the basic principle has been the peaceful development of cross-strait relations is based on opposition to Taiwan independence and adherence to the 1992 consensus. 
Um, what is left if you throw that, if you abandon that? Uh, the benefit probably would have been that we have some kind of stall in the near term, but um, in the longer term, we get a return to policies by Taiwan that are more friendly to us. Um, on, on this question here, um, I, I think that uh, the South China Sea is also a lit litmus test of what kind of great power uh, China is going to be. The Korean Peninsula is a litmus test. Iran is a litmus test. There are lots of litmus tests. Um, I um, am not surprised at all that uh, uh, President Ma and his government uh, maintained uh, their claim to Taiping Island. I don't think any Taiwan government can abandon that claim. Um, but I think it's also important that uh, Taiwan more or less aligns itself with the United States on how uh, to resolve some of these complex issues. And, uh, you know, that's good. Uh, thank you all for your great questions. Uh, thank you, Bonnie, for uh, um, doing uh, yeoman's or yo woman's work. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, on this conference, and I look forward to the last panel. We're going to get started in about seven or eight minutes, so 